Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Navina Nakvi. She is here at Yale as the Singh Visiting Fellow in the South Asian Studies Council. Professor Nakvi is a historian of early modern and modern South Asia, and her research interests include the Persianate world of the 13th to 19th centuries, the history of political Islam, and the social history of Hindustani music. Today we'll talk with Professor Nakvi about the history of Persianate South Asia at the dawn of colonialism. Welcome, Professor Nakvi. Thank you. So let's begin uh, with talking about your work. Tell us about it. So currently I'm working on a book project that is tentatively titled Writing the Inter-Imperial World in um, Afghan North India, 1757 to 1857. Um, and this project is centered on the writings of a set of fascinating actors. Um, these are all service figures, uh, and by that I mean um, sort of mid-tier or even lower rung, uh, petty scribes, soldiers, uh, minor legal officials. And these are people who actually mediate the very granular processes of uh, political transition from the Mughal Empire to the British colonial empire mm -hmm. in South Asia. And not only do they mediate this transition through their service, uh, but they actually write about it in these uh, Persian language diaries, memoirs, um, these sort of short historical tracts uh, in poetry and in letters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm looking at this set of actors um, and how they conceptualize political change in this regional context. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what led you to study this. Um, so I, uh, so this would require me to kind of give you some kind of historical context, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so the Mughal Empire is roughly from the 16th to the 18th centuries in South Asia, um, and British colonialism is formally, uh, it, it begins in 1857 and ends in 1947, but there's this sort of overlapping period, uh, which is the 1750s to the 1850s, uh, which I call the inter-imperial period. Historians and, uh, yeah, historians have broadly looked at this in terms of the various claims to, uh, these overlapping claims to uh, political authority in regional contexts. So as the Mughal Empire is decentralizing, these various regional successor states emerge, as they do in empires across the world. Mm -hmm. um, and historians have tended to focus on the formation of these regional states. What I'm looking at is how these regional states um, break apart in tandem with the empires that are already decentralizing. So it's like a state decentralizing within an empire that's already decentralizing. Okay. And I arrived at that idea because I was looking at these regional courts and I was studying Hindustani classical music um, as it was patronized and practiced in this particular setting in mm -hmm. North India. Uh, so I was looking at musical treatises in Urdu and in Persian uh, when I was doing my research in India. And I came across all these unpublished um, tracts uh, that were written roughly around the same period, from the 1750s to the 1850s. And I really didn't know who these people were, mm -hmm. why they were writing these works. They were relatively unknown figures. Um, most of these works did not make it to print. Uh, and this requires me to say also that print really takes off in South Asia in the 1830s onwards. Um, so there's a long-standing manuscript tradition that survives well into the 1850s. Mm -hmm. uh, but these materials were not deemed important enough to kind of make it to that world of print. Mm -hmm. So who were these figures? And that kind of set the wheels going. I see. Yeah. Okay. So how, I am curious now, um, since these weren't published works, Tell us about uh, the methodology. How did you access these works? And then also, how did you choose the people that you speak about in the book? Thank you. So um, I, I started going to this particular library. This is a, uh, it's called a, the, the Rampur Raza Library. Um, it's in the small town of Rampur, which is in modern day Uttar Pradesh. Uh, but this also used to be the capital of, um, of one of these regional successor states mm -hmm. that I'm talking about. Um, and this was settled by a group of Afghan, um, uh, Afghans, diasporic Afghans, I should say, uh, called the Rohilas. Um, and um, I, could you 
sort of remind me of what you just asked me? Yes, I'm wanting to know how you did the research and how you picked the people that you um, spotlight in the book. Right. Um, and so I, I, uh, I started sort of looking at courtly histories that mm -hmm. emerged from this particular context, uh, and I was studying Persian at the time. Um, and so I was reading them, and as I mentioned to you, I'd, you know, I'd gone to this library and I visited it again and again and again, uh, and I came across these particular works, and I saw that they did not necessarily, um, these figures did not figure into the formal courtly um, histories of okay. Rampur and the Rohila Afghans. Uh, and so I started asking myself, what are the questions that these people were trying to uh, address? Why were they writing these works that were not sort of formally recognized as important? Mm -hmm. And I started realizing that they were important because of precisely what I said earlier, that these are the people who eventually uh, start sort of entering the early colonial administration and really reflecting on what it means for the, the formal, uh, for the former ancien regime to disappear uh, and, and what it means to kind of contend with these forms of early colonial power, whether it be the legal administration, uh, whether it be the colonial sort of absorption of military services. And as these people are entering the ranks and they're making these decisions about what they should do, what are their sort of uh, options for employment and mm -hmm. for service, what happens to their land assignments. Uh, they sort of write in a very sort of personalized um, sort of, yeah, they, they sort of couch their ideas in these, uh, these sort of regional concerns of their neighborhood, of this sort of smaller town. Mm -hmm. But they're also reflecting on uh, on sort of wider political processes and seeing them in tandem with each other. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like this provincial backwater um, where things are sort of hermetically mm -hmm. sealed. There are these people who are seeing their regional context within a wider context mm -hmm. and writing about it. And it's very different from what you see right. in the courtly histories. Okay. And how things are changing in the world at that time. Can you give some specifics mm -hmm. about what people are talking about? Sure. Um, so a lot of the soldiers, for example, who I look at are uh, serving as... Um, and are these South Asian s soldiers? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So some of them are naturalized Afghans who've been there for maybe three or four generations. Mm -hmm. Others are not. They belong to different kind of ethnic backgrounds. Um, but they do... Um, so, so, to, so to answer your question, um, they, they're sort of reflecting on the recent past, um, how this regional state is coming apart, um, how, what, what that process looks like. So if I were to broadly categorize uh, the, the kind of arc that their writings trace, mm -hmm. I would say uh, in the early 1750s, the tendency is to kind of write in a restorationist mode, mm -hmm. where they're kind of looking to older empires and considering the possibility of their revival um, or realignment of politics and how they might sort of enter that space uh, as they're seeking opportunities for employment. Um, and then by the late 1780s, this sort of turns into an antiquarian mode where there's a sort of reckoning with the fact that the East India Company has disassembled this regional state. Uh, and you see that in the physical landscape. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these sort of scribes go about uh, documenting what that physical landscape looks like, mm -hmm. these forts that have been decimated or uh, sort of, yeah, really contending with the physical landscape and writing in the form of, of, of writing in an antiquarian mode. Um, and towards the end of the period that I look at, by the 1820s and 30s, uh, there's really sort of, Try, these people are trying to kind of see how they can fit into the legal administrative regime that the East India Company has set up. Mm -hmm. So they look at this through questions of service, as I've alluded to, uh, through questions of customary law, um, uh, through the a, a historical mode, a specifically not a universalist kind of historical mode, but one that focuses on the recent past mm -hmm. and what that means to them. Okay, are there any, as you're looking at the research and the people's writings, are there any differences of opinions or, you know, diverse views on what should be happening mm -hmm. or what shouldn't be happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, so I, 
I feel like th there's certainly it's not a, a it's not a sort of homogenous uh, playing field. That these are all different figures, and they 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 have um, uh, different perspectives mm -hmm. on politics. Um, I think what sort of puts them together is that they have a particular notion of regional um, identity that they kind of hang on to and mm -hmm. they draw on um, as they articulate their views. But some of them are very much in favor of, uh, you know, joining the East India Company. Others are very reluctant to do so. Um, still others are kind of looking back to the Mughal Ancien Regime and saying, well, could, is there a chance at some kind of revival? Uh, so there are definitely discordances, mm -hmm. um, also in terms of like who they are choosing to align themselves with. Um, there's there's certainly no um, unanimity on on the kind of okay. Mode Was in there which any lighting. extreme criticism, especially about? Um, the role of colonialism as it was taking over. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, um, uh, there's there's uh, there are ways in which they, especially the soldiers, um, because this is a heavily militarized context. The early 19th century, the late 18th and early 19th centuries, almost everybody uh, who isn't in a major cosmopolitan urban center, whether you're like a farmer, a cultivator, or an artisan, um, you are possibly or most likely also a part-time soldier. So it's a heavily militarized context. Um, there are all these sort of independent uh, armed camps that are kind of offering their services um, as, as mercenaries really to the highest bidder. Okay. Um, and so they, they uh, th there's, a, there's a sense that the East India Company is trying to monopolize this context mm -hmm. and, absor and sort of absorb all of these soldiers and these various camps into their ranks and there's a reluctance to kind of uh, acquiesce to that process mm -hmm. because it means uh, giving up their independence um, and giving up certain rights. And so there is definitely a criticism of early forms of colonial rule. Mm -hmm. This is not formal colonialism, right? That only starts in 1857. Right, right. Um, but yeah, that you definitely see some of that criticism mm -hmm. there. And let's talk about the poetry. That's something you also look at. Um, give us uh, an overview of your findings there. Um, so some of the poetry is written in a, it's not the most sophisticated poetry, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, I mean, they're writing in Persian and Urdu and some of them are writing in Pashto. And these are all languages that we sort of associate today with sort of romance and like high literary value and, and sort of imperial, urban, cosmopolitan cultures. So I will say that there is, th th these are not, some of them aren't even written in meter. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that, that's the first thing that strikes you is that some of these figures who are writing, whether it's the prose or the poetry, are um, either the first or second generation to come into literacy. So mm -hmm. They make a lot of errors in their writing in, in the actual orthography, mm -hmm. uh, as well as in, the, um, in the, the sort of format of the poetry, mm -hmm. um, as I was just saying. So, uh, but the themes are particularly interesting. Uh, one that stands, that stands out is sort of the sense of wandering, looking for employment from one place to the other. This is again the soldiers that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And sort of saying, well, I've been serving in these different armies, uh, but I want to go back to my Watan, the region that I'm from. Uh, and I want to get married and settle down <laughs> over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's one soldier who's mm -hmm. sort of reflecting, that's what love means to him, uh -huh. and he's writing about that. Um, there are others who are writing poetry about the importance of paper and how the bureaucratic uh, system that the East India Company has uh, begun to, to sort of instate, where there's, which is heavily invested in sort of double entry bookkeeping mm -hmm. and those forms. And he sort of writes, he writes a poem about this particular figure I'm talking about, writes a poem about the importance of paper and how you can't rule or get anything done without having things ratified by paper. Mm -hmm. So there are these very interesting yeah. kind of observations, real life mm -hmm. observations that, um, that, that figure into this kind of form of writing poetry. Right, yeah. right. Did you look at other forms of poetry that were commonplace during that time? I mean, I'm curious to know if poetry was um, 
a way for people to express themselves generally mm -hmm. um, or if it was just really this group of individuals that you're looking at? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so there's been quite a bit of work on um, some of the, the major sort of belles lettrists of this period, people who are sort of very uh, well-known mm -hmm. political theorists, poets. Um, there's been quite a bit of work on a particular form of poetry that takes off during this period. Uh, so the, these people are certainly not the only people to have this kind of self-reflexivity mm -hmm. as well as this perception of their place in this larger world that's changing. Uh, but it's really the fact that it's them and their context that I think makes it more interesting. Mm -hmm. but, but there certainly has been quite a bit of work on um, sort of more sophisticated literatures and, and mm -hmm. belles lettres from this period, for okay. sure. All right, so uh, in terms of the political and social perspectives, um, how did that change over the trans transition to colonialism? Can you speak a little bit to that? Um, yeah, um, so as I was saying earlier, there's uh, this sort of restorationist mode mm -hmm. uh, that you find in their writings um, that sort of turns into an antiquarian mode of mm -hmm. reckoning with the recent past and then that kind of turns into a, a reluctant mm -hmm. acquiescence with early forms of colonialism. I would broadly say that that is the arc that it, okay. that it takes. Okay. And then what would you like your readers to take away? I, are you still working on the book? Is it still yes. a work in progress? Yeah. So ultimately, when you finish, you know, what would you like the reader to come away with your book knowing? Well, um, this is actually something that I, I, um, I may have wanted to say earlier during the course of this interview, but the, the, the South Asia occupies a place within this larger realm, mm -hmm. which um, historians uh, uh, as well as scholars of literature have called the Persianate world, uh, spanning you know, the region from Sarajevo to Western China, wow. where Persian from the 13th, roughly from the 13th to the early 19th century was the lingua franca. It was the language of administration. It was also the language of sort of a high register of literary output mm -hmm. um, across this huge region comprising different sorts of people. Um, and so there's been a lot of work on this Persianate culture, as it's called. Um, whereas what I'm trying to do is to sort of see how this Persianate world is fragmenting with the dawn of colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm certainly not the first person to do it, but what I am trying to do that I think is original is looking at how um, these regional contexts fit into the Persianate world mm -hmm. um, and how this language and this form uh, that's associated with sort of sophisticated writing kind of filters down, I suppose, to, to sort of mid-ranking mid writers mm -hmm. uh, and how it becomes uh, a way of, of uh, reckoning with, uh, with their realities mm -hmm. rather than with what's going on in the court and the state of the empire, uh, which I think scholars of Persian literature have tended to focus on. So mm -hmm. I'm really looking at the place of the region um, within the fragmenting Persian mm -hmm. world. Um, and that's sort of the larger takeaway that I hope uh, people will um, will sort of focus on. And the other thing, if I may sure. also add is, you know, I grew up in India in the 80s and 90s where um, when regional states were still sort of fragmenting, they have been even like as recently as four or five years ago, the idea of a regional state, whether it be ethnic identity, linguistic or political identity is very strong in South Asia. Uh, and in the post-colonial uh, context. Uh, and I, I'm trying to see how that regionalism has a kind of longer history that even precedes colonialism uh, and, and sort of trace some of its antecedents. And I see that in the writings that these people produce. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it sort of is, is tied to some of my observations of, of how South Asia looks like, what it looks like today as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, this has been 
Very interesting. Thank you for being here with Thank us today. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for your interest. Thanks for your questions. Okay. For more information about Professor Nakavi and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through the funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you.